to ATCM EM Rapid 2022. I am Dr. Benu Bright and today we are discussing about shoulder disc equation. So the shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint comprising of four joints that is glenar humeral, acromioclavicular, sternoclavicular and scapulothoracic in which the most important one is the glenar humeral joint. This is the articulation between the glenar fossa of scapula and the articular surface of the humeral head. The socket of the shoulder is shallow uh, but the glenoid labrum deepens the socket and helps in providing joint stability. Along with that the capsule and the tendons attachments also provide some additional stability. So basically shoulder joint is a very mobile but also a very unstable joint. And the stability is provided by the rotator cuff muscles namely the infraspinatus, supraspinatus, tuberous minor and subscapularis. So when do we call it a shoulder dislocation? So basically when the head of the humerus separates from the scapula at the glenoid humeral joint, we call it shoulder dislocation. And it can happen in different directions. When the head is uh, coming in front of the uh, glenoid uh, socket, we call it anterior dislocation. It is the most common dislocation coming to more than 95% of the cases coming to here. And it usually happens when the arm is extended. The followed by the next presentation is uh, posterior dislocation which comes to about 2 to 4% in which the head of the humerus is moved behind and above the socket. And this is an uncommon type of dislocation and usually caused by seizures or an electric shock like situations. And the least common is the inferior dislocation where the head of the humerus is pushed down and out of the socket toward the armpit. And this is the least common type of dislocation. So in case of short dislocation, the history is very crucial because asking the mechanism of injury and the position of the arm at the time of injury can give an idea about the type of dislocation. In anterior dislocation, the arm will be abducted and externally rotated. In posterior, the arm will be abducted and internally rotated. And in case of inferior dislocation, the arm will be fully abducted and the elbow will appear to be often flexed on or behind the head. So on clinical examination, we may be able to notice a loss of normal contour of shoulder on the affected side and the patient will complain of severe shoulder pain. And the range of movements will also be decreased in the affected side along with we may be able to palpate the humeral head. The apprehension test which we done do for the stability of the shoulder joint will also be turned positive. So the combination of abduction, extension, external rotation with sufficient force will cause an anterior dislocation. And there are multiple types of anterior glenohumeral dislocations and in which the associated arm is usually in a slight abducted state with external rotated and the shoulder is squared off lacking the normal rounded contour. The patient resists any abducted movement of adduction and internal rotation and often cannot touch the contour of the shoulder with the hand of the affected extremity. And the humeral head can often be palpated anteriorly. The axillary nerve is the most common injured nerve and this nerve will be tested by pinprick sensation over the skin of dead joint muscle. So pre-reduction radiographs are advisable when there, is a, there has been a history of significant trauma unless there is time is crucial because the circulation has been compromised. Because radiographs are needed to uh, differentiate between dislocation and fracture dislocation uh, which may have similar appearance on physical examination. But the techniques which we use to treat them are very different. So obtain an AP or anterior posterior view and along with that an either an axillary or a scapular lateral view or a Y radiograph before attempting reduction in patients with first time dislocation or if a fracture is suspected or to confirm the anatomic type of dislocation and to identify any associated fractures. So although the anteroposterior radiograph will reveal the dislocation, the axillary or the scapular Y radiograph will indicate whether the dislocation is anterior or posterior. And the post reduction radiographs are valuable in confirming the success of joint reduction and as well as for providing documentation. And in the event that the joint re dislocates after the patient is discharged from the ED, this can also be used as a valuable proof. The short dislocations or subluxations combined with proximal humerus fractures will usually require orthopedic intervention and may even require ortho operative repair. The incidence of short dislocation with associated fracture increases with age and rises with each decade of life. And now coming to the general treatment of anterior glenohumeral dislocation. So basically in most patients the shoulder dislocation will produce a significant amount of pain and muscle spasm. 
and so therefore it is essential to provide appropriate analgesia. The muscle relaxation and pain management should be tailored to the individual patient and it may include NSAIDs, opiates or benzodiazepines and intra-articular lidocaine injection or procedural sedation. The use of procedural sedation is very common but any reduction technique may be attempted without any medication when performed slowly and automatically. So although one can significantly reduce the pain with IV medications, the most effective way to reduce pain is rapidly reducing the dislocation. An intra-articular injection of 10 to 20 ml of 1% lidocaine reduces the pain associated with reduction and can complement the procedural sedation. So basically after sterile skin preparation, we can introduce the needle at the hollow created by the displaced humeral head and inject about 10 to 20 ml of 1% lidocaine, just inferior to the acromion. Ultrasound can also be used to facilitate this injection, intra-articular injection and perform neurovascular examination before and after the reduction. So there are numerous techniques which can be used to reduce the joint like the traction counter traction technique, Stimson technique, uh, scapula manipulation technique, uh, Cocker's technique, Mills technique, Cunningham technique and Ferris technique. And all these reduction techniques can be categorized into three main categories as traction, leverage and scapular manipulation. So the first one is the traction counter traction technique or the modified Hippocratic technique. So in which the patient is kept in a supine position with the arm abducted and elbow flexed at 90 degrees. A sheet is tried across the thorax of the patient and then around the waist of the attendant and another sheet is tied and placed around the forearm of the patient and at the elbow level and the waist of the physician. And gradually traction is applied at the proximal forearm and as the assistant gives counter traction. Gentle internal and external rotation or outward pressure on the proximal humerus may aid this reduction. So next is the Stimson technique in which the patient is kept in a prone position on the table with the affected limb hanging freely over the edge and about 10 to 15 pounds of weight is suspended from the wrist which is about 5 to 7.5 kg and gradual traction from the gravity or from the muscle spasm and in most cases achieves the reduction by about 20 to 25 minutes. And sometimes we can also inject intra-articular lidocaine to uh, reduce the pain in this procedure. Although time consuming, this is a very safe and effective and easy to learn technique. And next is scapular manipulation technique which is also a variant of the uh, Stimson technique in which the patient is positioned in the same way with weights and after adequate sedation, the physician tried to push the tip of the scapula medially with the using the thumbs by stabilizing the superior aspect with the scapulate hand. And this technique has reported a 96% success rate. So the next is the caucus technique or the external rotation technique. So in which the patient is placed in a supine position with the affected arm adapted to the patient's side and with the elbow flexed at 90 degrees of flexion uh, the arm is slowly externally rotated. So no long-term traction is applied but the movement is performed slowly so as to allow for the spasm and pain to resolve. And the rotation usually completes when the, uh, before reaching the coronal plane and is often not noticed by either the physician or the patient. And if needed the play, elbow may be brought to anteriorly and internally rotated to the opposite shoulder. So the next is the Milch technique and in which the arm is abducted to 180 degrees along with external rotation and with simultaneous pressure of the humeral head. And along with that, inline longitudinal traction is applied with continuous pressure on the humeral head until the dislocation is put back in place. Next we have a different technique that is the Cunningham technique which is a combination of both humeral and scapular positioning with a specific massage of spa spasming the biceps muscle. So basically the patient is seated in a <coughs> comfortable position upright as possible with shoulders relaxed and supporting the affected arm slowly and gently move the humerus into full adduction with the elbow in flexion and give the hand of the affected extremity resting on the physician's shoulder and gently massage the trapezius and deltoid so as to relax the patient and then gently massage the biceps at the mid humeral level and ask the patient to elevate and shrug the, or retract the shoulders and continue the biceps massage. And the goal is to wait for the patient to relax fully and have the humeral head slip back into place. So the next is the Ferris technique. It is the short abbreviation for fast, reliable and safe. 
It is a modified Milch technique and may be used as an alternative of choice. It has shown a success rate of more than 90% without any use of sedation, anesthesia, or analgesia. So we place the patient in a supine position and hold the patient's wrist with gentle traction in a neutral position. And the limb is moved anteriorly and posteriorly in small oscillating movements on the outstretched arm and start updating the arm slowly while continuing this traction. And once the limb is updated to 90 degrees, the limb is externally rotated and continues to update the arm past this position. A reduction is usually, uh, usually achieved once the uh, limb is updated to around 120 degrees. Successful reduction of the acute posterior short dislocation without generalization has been achieved using virus method. The complications associated with anterior dislocation include recurrence, rotator cuff tears, humeral head bony defects, hill sac deformity, glenoid labral defects, and rarely neurovascular injuries. And the most common complication is recurrent dislocation and in case of children and young adults, it is more than 90% chance. And early surgical repair may decrease the recurrence rate and so patients with first-time short dislocation should be referred to orthopedic evaluation. Rotator cuff tears can be difficult to identify in ED after reduction but can be suspected if there is weakness upon external rotation. And the rotator cuff weakens with advancing age and in older patients is usually associated with and a dislocation. So any patient with pain persisting for more, greater, more than two weeks should follow up with orthopedics. Next are bony injuries which are common and include fractures of the humeral head, that is hill sacs lesions, then glenoid, that is bony bankard lesion, and tears of the anterior glenoid labrum, that is soft bankard lesion and greater tuberosity. And such fractures are usually evident on the post reduction films and there is no specific ED treatment that is advised to follow up with orthopedics. Vascular injuries are rare, but when they occur, they tend to involve the axillary artery in elderly patients. And clinical findings of vascular injury include absent radial pulse, axillary hematoma, bruising of the lateral chest wall, and an axillary bruise. And nerve injuries may occur in up to 10 to 20 percent of the 25 percent of acute dislocations, and a result of mainly traction neuroplasia. And most involve the axillary nerve and resulting in loss of sensation of skin over the upper arm. And this injury is temporary and results spontaneously. And the motor portion of the axillary nerve supplies the teres minor and the deltoid. And the injury can result in weakness of the shoulder abduction and external rotation. Other nerves that will be injured are radial, ulnar, median, muscular cutaneous, and brachial plexus. So the next is posterior vena humeral dislocation. Posterior dislocation may occur with the humeral head in the subacromial, subglenoid, or subspinous position. But most often it occurs with the humeral head posterior to the glenoid inferior to the acromion. The subglenoid and subspinous positions are usually rare. The usual mechanism is an indirect force that produces a forceful internal rotation and adduction or a direct blow to the anterior shoulder. And on examination, there is a prominence of the posterior shoulder and the anterior flattening of the normal shoulder contour on the affected side, especially when compared to the non-affected side. The patient will be unable to external rotate or update the affected arm. The scapular Y radiograph is diagnostic of posterior dislocation and the same can also be demonstrated using an axillary view. The reduction of a posterior dislocation is performed with the patient in supine position. Apply traction to the rectal arm in the long axis of the humerus and have an assistant gently push the humeral head anteriorly into the glenoid fossa. Fractures of the posterior glenoid rim, a humeral head or the reverse hill sacs deformity, a humeral shaft lesser tuberosity are common complications. Neurovascular and rotator cuff tears are less common than in anterior dislocation, but uh, obtain a post-reduction radiograph to confirm successful reduction. Mobilize the shoulder with an arm sling and advise the patient to follow up in, with an orthopedist. Inferior dislocation is associated with significant soft tissue trauma or fracture. Because the mechanism of injury is usually a hyperabduction force which levers the neck of the humerus against the neckronomium. And as the force continues, the inferior tab capsule tears and the humeral head is forced out inferiorly. The patient may present with humerus fully abducted and the elbow flexed and the patient's hand on or behind the head. And the humeral head can be palpated on the lateral chest wall. The reduction consists of traction in an upward and outward direction in line with the humerus. 
and have an assistant apply counter traction and reduction is signaled by a clunk. The arm is again brought to the patient's side and immobilized by a shoulder immobilizer. Complications include severe soft tissue injuries and fractures of the proximal humerus, the rotator cuff which usually become detached and require orthopedic follow-up, the neurovascular compression injuries which are usually found but almost always resolved after reduction, and when the humeral head is buttonholed through the inferior capsule, the dislocation is irreducible and operatory reduction may be required. And finally, disposition. After reduction, place the arm in a shoulder immobilizer or sling that maintains the shoulder in adduction and internal rotation. And provide instructions to orthopedic follow in one week for uncomplicated dislocation and within one to two days for dislocations complicated by bony or soft tissue injury. Thank you.